Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Unlock Show. I'm your host, Tracy Wilson. My pleasure to be here with you guys today because you're in for an absolute treat. If you've tuned in to any of the shows in the past on The Unlocked Show with me, you'll know that the guests that I have are world class and they come to us sharing all of their information from a very knowing place. And I'm going to tell you that today's guest is no exception. You'll understand that in today's marketplace, that it's just no longer enough for us to think about our customers, to actually compete and win in this day and age. We've actually got to think like our customers, not just about them. So in today's thought-provoking episode, we're going to be, you're going to be introduced to some key principles. You're going to be introduced to the principles of shopper psychology and the impact that decision-making and purchasing behavior. And the person that I've brought to today's show to do that is the amazing Dr. Chris Gray. He's got a background in retail. He's got an extensive background and real world experience in this particular industry. I'm gonna say he's got a real knack for being able to translate really complex psychological concepts and being able to bring all of those together and present them to you in a very useful and actionable ways so that you can go away and implement them into your business, understand and think like your customer in a completely different way that not only is going to bring you closer to that customer and understanding who they are, but also enable you to bring a whole lot more of the type of customers you want into your world. He's worked with some amazing brands like Coca-Cola, Nestle, um, PepsiCo, Walmart, and a bunch of others. The list is enormous. So I want you guys to really tune in today, really listen to what he's uh, talking about, because I can assure you that what he's going to share with you today is world class, and it has the capacity to really be able to change the way that you think about your customers and change your business. So please stay tuned as we unlock these strategies and we share with you exactly how you can implement them into your business enabling you to attract, engage, and motivate customers, not just to come and say hello, but to actually click the button and buy now. So welcome to the show, Chris. It's absolutely fabulous to have you here. Thank you so much, Tracy. I know um, we've both been anticipating this for a while, um, and well, I'm so we have. to be here. <laughs> and by the way, am I, I blushing? Because that introduction was awesome, and I feel like I'm blushing right now. So, <laughs> oh well, that's okay. You it. totally can take it all. It's um, you know, it's 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 well deserved because you know the experience that you've got and the background and the work that you've done in this industry is absolutely world class. So I'm really pleased to have Thank you. you here. Thank you. So I'm really interested to know, like. Um, for, for our viewers, like, how did you even get into this? Because I know, you know, your background in retail has kind of led you down this path to be doing what you're doing now. So just enlighten us a little bit more. Give us some background on what it was that you that brought you to this. And what specifically are you doing right now that is having the biggest impact on people's yeah. lives? Well, um, it's funny you asked. I think that there are two questions that I get the most frequently. And the first is how did you get from being a psychologist working in marketing and retail? Like, how did that happen? Um, and the other one I'll tell you about later. But um, for me, I, I always, I grew up in retail. So my family, my parents, uh, when I was four years old, they bought a uh, furniture business. My dad had, was a school teacher. My mother had been a homemaker. And they were 24 years old and they started a business. And um, so I was, I literally grew up in this amazingly beautiful building. If you go to my website, you'll see pictures of it. Um, it's just, I, I feel so um, privileged to have like grown up um, in, not only in a beautiful building that was, I mean, it's four stories, it's gore, it was an old theater. I mean, it, it was just a fun place to, to, to hang out as a kid. But also uh, to see firsthand how my parents um, really took the time and effort to understand people first and foremost. Um, and I'm happy to say that uh, to this day, uh, Gray's Furniture and Boutique in lovely Mount Pleasant, Michigan is still going strong. And uh, I think in a time when so many mom pop shops have struggled and gone under, 
I think what for them has been the difference is that they have really embedded themselves in their community um, and really have taken the time to know people as people, you know, know their customers, mm. know them by name when they walk in the door, know, you know, what, you know, anticipate what they're looking for, be able to work with them and, and really show that they care. And I th think that through the hard times, and there definitely have been some hard times, um, that has really kept them going along with their ability to, to flex when needed. I mean, I remember in the, in the early eighties, um, Grace Furniture was the first uh, video rental place in our little town uh, because my parents saw it like, Hey, people want this and we sell TVs anyway. So why don't we do, you know? And, and so for a period of like 10 years, they, they rented um, VCR tapes and, you know, and so they were just so, so um, I think today we'd say agile um, yeah. and, but really based in like understanding their, their customer and what they needed. And so that's really kind of my, my, my background of how I grew up. And then I kind of tried to get away from that a little bit and uh, decided to go into psychology um, and uh, got an undergraduate degree and then went to uh, college, uh, college and um grad school and uh, achieved my doctorate in psychology, but I realized kind of along the way that I didn't love being a therapist. And so I had to figure out like, okay, now <laughs> what do I do? Um, but I was fortunate enough to have some mentors that really kind of took me under their wing and helped me see like what you've developed with this knowledge um, has been, it, it will be so important for you in whatever field you want to go into. And uh, around that time, I led my first focus group and fell in love with that. And what I love about it is that I get to spend time with people. Um, I get to talk. I mean, I've been a qualitative researcher for 25 years, as well as a strategist. And I just love being able to, to spend time with people and understand their world um, because it, it's, I find it infinitely fascinating. But I also know that, that it is really key to success for my clients. Uh, and so really understanding people at, at the level of people, not just as customers, but what's going on in their lives, what matters to them, because those are the things that are going to draw people in to your solutions, your ideas, um, is how relevant they are, how meaningful they are, not just when they walk in the door, or they go onto your website, but in their lives, what's matter, what matters to them? Mm. Well, I mean, you know, having the privilege of being able to grow up with parents as you did that you had the opportunity to be able to see them in real time be agile and be innovative and think about and look for gaps in the market and it's interesting because you know that little story that you've just told absolutely showed that you've emulated what they did you know okay well I'm here you know I'm not really liking what I'm doing right now but how do I kind of use my background and be a little bit agile and, and meld <laughs> a couple of worlds together to get where you are today um, and I think that creates something quite special in uh, in somebody when they're able to do that and not just be a one-trick wonder but actually really thinking about what's going on and how do I meld these two together yeah. So when I know that you've done, you know, when we think about some of the the amazing companies that you've done some work with over time, you know, you're talking the likes of um, the Coca-Colas and PepsiCo and, and Walmart and the like. And I know that some time ago, like, and we're going back a little while, but you did a bit of an experiment and you took a bunch of people out <laughs> on a bit of a shopping expedition. And I think, you know, from what I've read, that was really to try and, almost like observe what like what's going on here what are the buyer behaviors and so do you want to just give us a little bit of um you know give us some context around yeah. that and why did you do that and, and what did you actually see and find yeah thank you for that um it, it honestly was one of the pinnacles of my career um many years ago um probably 2003 or 2004 that that time period i uh, was challenged with um, some clients, big name clients that were coming in, their, their C-level folks were coming in to visit our agency. And this is right at the very beginnings of what would become shopper marketing. Um, so you know, look, take, looking very strategically at retail. And they said to us, we're going to give you one day to prove to us that we should care about this. That, you know, that, that, you know, really looking at retail more strategically will make a difference for us or that, you know, somehow that's going to make a difference in our business. 
And I forget, our CEO said, oh, yeah, great. We'll do it. Chris, <laughs> you mm -hmm. got it. I'm like, okay, here we go. Um, and I think this is actually comes from one of the principles that I love to share is that experience is undeniable. It's one thing to talk about um, situations or people or, um, you, know, a, a, you know, shopping experience, for example. It's another thing altogether to put yourself literally in the position of someone who is your customer profile and try to make ends meet. And that's what this was about. And so what we did is we created uh, so, uh, several shopper profiles and we had the clients, um, they would open up their package and they were in teams of three or so, um, so that it forced them to have to discuss these decisions, not just you know, have them mm -hmm. internally. And they, they received the, the profile, um, a shopping list of about eight to 10 items and actual cash money for their, for their budget. And we took them to um, the store and they actually had to execute the shopping list based on their profile and then come back and present to us their, what, they, what they purchased, what decisions they had to make, what was challenging, it was difficult, where they had to make substitutions because we made sure that some of them did not have all the money they needed to have everything. Um, and so they would have to make some tough choices. And so what we were doing in that situation is, is instead of, because originally they, they had said, well, let's just follow some shoppers around. And I just thought mm -hmm. that, you know, that'll be interesting, but it won't have the impact of having to struggle with these things yourself. And so we created this um, and we called it Shopper Passport. And then probably about, oh gosh, five years later, um, uh, another big company uh, called us up and said, hey, we're having a um, sales and marketing uh, conference for all of our sales and marketing people around the world. And we want to give you a day. Um, and we've heard about this shopper passport that you've created. And um, we'd love to see if, if you could make this happen for us. I'm like, okay, yeah, that sounds really interesting. That sounds great. What are we talking about for how many people? They said, oh, it'll be about 700. <laughs> and I mean, you should see my eyes. Just a few. Because <laughs> um, it's one thing to take like, you know, 12 people. Um, but it was an entirely uh, different thing to take uh, 700 people marketing executive shopping in a single day and i'm happy to say um we pulled it off um i think the thing i'm most proud of is that we didn't lose anybody because we literally were carting people in buses to i, mean, I think there were like 17 different retailers um and it was just it was this whole thing it took months of planning um it was a whole team i cannot take any credit other than i originally came up with the idea and i led the process um but it, it, it went off without a hitch. And it was um, later when they surveyed their um, attendees, it was considered the most effective part of the three-day conference. So I, it was something I was really proud of. Um, the feedback was fantastic. People really were touched by the experience. Um, and one of the things, one of the questions that I always ask in the debrief is, because I always make sure that the shopping list would have at least a few items from their categories, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I always will ask, okay, let's be honest here. How many of you bought either a competitive product or a private label product in one of your own categories? And you see people kind of like, and, you know, and they talk about, and you know, talk about why that is, it's because I, I just couldn't afford our product. You know, I, I just, I didn't, mm -hmm. I had to make some tough choices and given the needs of my shopper and the situation that they were in, it just, I just couldn't justify it. And so, you know, you, then that really opens up a whole discussion about, you know, okay, great. You know, and, and it's not about shaming anyone or anything. It really is about, okay, what can we take from this? You know, and what can you go yeah. back to your office tomorrow and start doing with that information, that experience that you've just had. And, and it's, uh, it's just been a great, it, it was a great experience. So, so when, um, you know, if we put, try to put this into some context for even those, because a, a lot of our viewers either have brick and mortar um, style businesses, or they have some form of online business. And, and this is relevant regardless, right? Because, you know, customers are customers, people are people, right. and the, the psychological, um, you know, components of all of that are the same. So when, when, with that particular instance, like having the opportunity to take 700 people out in one foul swoop, 
would provide you with so much like real-time information. What are some of the, the, I suppose, some of the myths or some of the things that we think are uh, the ways in which our, you know, the buyer uh, operates compared to what actually happens? Yeah. And, and how can we think about those, um, you know, to the advantage of our businesses? Yeah, I, I, this is something that I'm really passionate about. Um, I just gave a, a speech at the uh, Path to Purchase Institute um, two weeks ago on this very subject of consumer myths. And I, I really want to be clear about why I'm so passionate about it, because I think um, some of this can get a little provocative and I, I it can go sideways if I'm not clear about why I think it's important. And mm -hmm. it, it really is about help, helping people to be able to focus on what what's true, what's real, um, and what's meaningful so that we can all be effective going forward. There are, you know, in the world, in the marketing world, you know, myths get kind of passed around and suddenly they sound like the truth and um, they can end up wasting a lot of time. They can point you in the wrong direction. They can create disconnections with your customers. And so I always think it's important to, to consistently and continually be updating our, our information. Um, and so it's mm -hmm. something that I spend a lot of time on I am actually in the process, very beginning stages of, of writing a book about um, myths of consumer psychology. And um, so I just think it's, it, it is something that I hope empowers people. It is not meant to be shaming. We, I, some of these, I believe myself um, and doing a little digging, had to really challenge myself like, okay, I've, you know, I've, I've actually used this in a speech before. And now I have to go back and say, okay, no, it wasn't really true. Um, so it's not about it, about shaming. It really is about how can we all continually be updating our maps, uh, you know, our mental maps, mm -hmm. so that we are we are really dealing with reality. Um, but one of them is uh, that consumer psychology is changing rapidly, and like I mentioned, you know, I've been uh, a consumer psychologist for twenty five years. I don't think a month has gone by that I haven't seen some blaring headline about shoppers have changed forever. Consumers have changed forever. Everything's different now. And especially the last couple of years. And there's a lot to talk about that has changed in the last couple of years. Um, but I think it is important to separate out um, on this hand, you know, um, the, the psychology and on this hand, <laughs> the behavior. Uh, because mm -hmm. as much as they are intertwined, they are two very different things. Behavior changes rapidly all the time. I mean, we've seen in the last two years how, you know, consumer behavior has just you know had an upheaval, right? Um, well, and we're still going to see where this all lands. You know, I think this is part of that, too, which is I think some of this is not going to stick as much as people think some of these new behaviors. Um, but that, I'll get to that one later. Um, but psychology, how our brains work, you, our, you know, sense of our psyche, uh, our needs, our, uh, you know, uh, motivations, those types of things, they're much more stable over time. Um, and so, you know, for example, I could go back to, you know, ancient Roman times and talk about, you know, why did someone go to the market, you know, in Roman, ancient Roman times? Well, if we really dig into the underlying psychology of it, it is about feeling prepared, feeling secure mm -hmm. that I have what I need for my family, taking care of other people. So there's that connection, that caring, um, and really just being, making sure that everyone has what they need on a daily basis to succeed. If we think about today, whether you go to a grocery store or you go you know, online to have your groceries delivered, we talk about, okay, well, why do you, what is the underlying motivating factors behind that? you're going to see a lot of the same motivations, right? I mean, it is still is about making sure we're prepared and we are secure and we have what we need to be successful, and taking care of other people, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I, you can obviously say that the way that people shopped in ancient Roman times and the way they shop today are vastly different. In fact, the way that we shopped five years ago versus today are often vastly different. But that underlying psychology is much more stable. And I think it's important for people to know this because it gives us an anchor. It gives us a foundation to work from so that we can anticipate challenges and we can respond to them very quickly because we know that when a change is happening in behavior, we can go back to the foundation of well, what is it that they're trying to accomplish 
And how can I help them do it faster, easier, less expensively, more enjoyably, et cetera, so that I'm creating a solution that will connect with them and they'll want it. And so mm. I think that if we are just constantly saying, well, we have to have everything new, everything, new data, new information, new. Yes, I think behavioral data changes very rapidly. We have to stay on top of it because that that data driven mindset is things are going to change very quickly. But if we delve into the psychology, you can look at studies that are five, 10, 20 years old, and they're still very relevant because they're going at a much deeper level. And we can use that as a foundation to help us respond to our customers needs much more quickly. Uh, and I like that you've made that, you know, that makes a lot of sense to make that level of distinction. And I think about even someone like, um, you know, the Maslow hierarchy of needs and, you know, and, and a lot of what you've just talk, talked talked mm -hmm. about there. I mean, that's a pretty, you know, I can't remember how old it is, but it's. It's pretty old. old. Yeah. It's pretty old, right? And it's the same stuff. So it's like these are the foundational things. These are psychologically the things that we as humans want and need that, that make us feel secure, prepared, connected, loved, all of those sorts of things. And then, then – layering on top of that now let's understand the actually behavior the actual behaviors that people are displaying based on and i suppose the behaviors actually change based on a lot of factors right that economy what's going on around the world the internal external kind of um pulls that that uh, people are going through that's the that's the um the the flexible piece of the puzzle that moves all the time, but yet mm -hmm. the psychology piece tends to remain, as you say, you know, relatively stable um, yeah. regardless of what's going on. And, and, and sometimes and we'll I, see, like when there's a big upheaval, like so we've had the pandemic, right? So what we see mm. though is that some of those, so like, like you know, Maslow's hierarchy, right? So if a certain need at lower in the hierarchy isn't being met, everything else kind of evaporates, right? So like if, you know, we're all terrified that, you know, uh, for our security, for our safety, we're going to all run to the grocery store apparently and buy toilet paper. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it, it, but it, that is based on it. That was really based on this need for certainty and security and something to hold mm. on to literally. Um, but something that felt like a basic that would somehow bring comfort. And it was, it just happened to be toilet paper this time. Isn't that, I mean, that to me was just such a fascinating behavioral, yeah. Um, you know, a change for people to make something. I and, mean, you know, we made a lot of fun about it. Oh, everyone's going crazy about toilet paper. But, you know, when you really, like you say, you pull back the curtain on this and you're looking at like, what is the underlying uh, driving factor to this? And it all comes back to the, the need for, to feel secure, the need for us to feel, you know, some mm -hmm. level of cleanliness because that then gives us a level of comfort and security. So it's really quite, it's yeah. actually, yeah. quite fascinating it does when you really look good. at it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, I'll give um, you an I'll... example. I want to just give you a quick example of, I think, mm. a, a marketing campaign that was was based on an insight that is ages old, um, but was extremely successful. And so the I'll start with the, the insight was something around, and I'm kind of reverse engineering this myself. I'm not exactly sure what their, their insight was, but it, it must have been something around the idea of identity and how it, important your identity is and mm. you know uh, it is something that we spend a lot of time um you know sort of making sure that you know ha ha thinking about how we come across to others thinking about our identity you know people like to talk about themselves you know here i am um and <laughs> so but that you could say that for that's centuries old right i mean that's not something brand new yeah. um and yet uh coca-cola a few years ago um they did the uh, share a Coke campaign where they, all they did was put names on the cans and it started in Australia uh, and it became a worldwide phenomenon. It was one of the most successful marketing campaigns in history based on an ages old insight, um, but putting a, you know, a modern relevant twist on it. And I think that I always get, a, you know, my eye twitches a little bit when I hear clients that we have to have new insights, we have to have new insights. And, and I think, well, you know, we have to have new data I get that, you know, data has to be refreshed frequently. Insights go deeper. And when you really hit an in-depth, meaningful insight, it has a shelf life of, could, can be decades. 
I mean, that's a, a fantastic example of, you know, a, a major company using that age old, you know, we want to feel like we're important. My name's on something. I mean, they do say that, um, you know, psychologically, when we see our name on something, you know, you have that instant connection to it. So, I mean, Absolutely. using that, uh, I'm going to say bloody smart, you know, right. for, for a company, right, to, to go down that path. Um, what are some of, you know, when from a sales and marketing perspective, when we sort of overlay the psychological pieces to this, what are some of the insights that you've got that you think that every kind of sales and marketing leader should really know about? Like, what are the stuff that was like, I've seen this, and if you don't know about it, you're kind of living under a rock or you're missing, you're, you're, you're missing a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, a lot of these I focus around emotion because I think um, mm. there's a lot of, um, I, I don't, I think emotion is talked a lot about, but I think it is utilized. Um, inconsistently at best. Um, but I think there's so much power in emotion. And so I, I talk, I spend a lot of time researching and talking about emotion. Uh, one of those is that um, it's important to know that emotional reactions or emotional responses are inevitable. Um, we as human beings were wired to respond to things emotionally, and we respond to them extremely quickly. Um, we can respond to um, emotionally to a situation multitudes of times faster than we can process it cognitively. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's like, sometimes you'll get a gut feeling and you're not sure why. Well, often it's because you're having an emotional reaction to something that you haven't processed yet. And I mean, I think I don't have, I can't remember the exact number, but it's like 0.3 microseconds, or I think it's even less than that. Like, but it, it is, it is extremely fast um, how we respond to things. And it is inevitable. There is no such thing as an emotionally neutral experience. Um, we are just wired that way to go one way or the other. And so I often hear marketers kind of talking about emotion in sort of derogatory terms or thinking of it as soft skills or being fluffy. There's nothing that could be further from the truth on this. Um, when you are able to understand and harness the power of emotion, it is, you, you, you can't miss it. I mean, you know, going back to the Coca-Cola example, I mean, it's very emotional to see your name on something, mm. right? You feel ownership, you feel excited. Mm. Um, and it's an emotional connection. And so what I say to clients is, look, your customer is going to uh, engage emotionally with your brand, your product, your advertising, whatever it is, uh, one way or the other. It's just a matter of how strategic you're going to be about it. Are you just going to leave it to chance or are you going to be strategic in the way that you think about what is the emotion that we want to be connected to? And then how do we sort of backtrack and create the steps to get there with our customer? If you don't do that, then you really are leaving a lot of things to chance. And I, you, know, you see a, a mm -hmm. lot of times there are reactions that were unanticipated um, or, you know, they just didn't think about. And it's like, well, if, maybe if we had, you know, spent some time being strategic about the kinds of emotional responses you're looking for, that that could be um, very useful. You know, it, it's, it's interesting in this sense and that, you know, taking the time to really think about this from a an emotional standpoint, like we started this whole show off in terms of like not just um, knowing about your customer, um, but actually really understanding them at a, at a at a personal person mm -hmm. a person level, and we are um, you know emotional beings. We, we are, and like you say, we we flip our emotions on within a split second. You everything you do, there is an emotional reaction to it even people watching us today yeah. they're feeling something about you know we like them we don't like them look at their hair i mean they're having all of these emotional it's... responses to everything that's being said and everything that they see so when when, when we're thinking about this from a a business um point of view and we're you know maybe we're doing some customer avatar work and we're trying to understand mm -hmm. our customer and really you know, not just at the 
um, at the surface level, you know, um, gender and, and, and that sort of um, perspective, but really a, a rather deep on this and understanding, yeah. you know, what emotions do we want them to feel when they are dealing with our brand? And, and that means, obviously, not just across everything, across what they see and the colours that we use, across how we present ourselves online. It's, it's everything, right? So yeah. do you want to give a little bit of insight into, into that and what people should really be thinking about? Yeah, I think, and it's, it's, I think it's very astute of you to, to put that together, that it, it is in everything that you do because it is additive. I mean, these things, you know, many times I hear someone say, well, you know, I, I, the commercial was fine, but it wouldn't make me want to buy something. I'm like, well, that's not exactly how advertising works. Um, it is, as, as someone eloquently put, it wasn't me, but they said, you know, it's like feathers on a scale, you know, like every, it's just mm -hmm. everyone is just like a little bit more, a little bit more. And then you get, you sort of reach that point where I now I'm making associations with this brand based on these emotions that I'm experiencing, based on how I feel about it. And I think that, um, so it's not, I, we shouldn't really think about it as like this one thing is going to change everything. Um, mm. The closest we get to that, I think, is retail marketing or shopper marketing because you are in the moment right there. And, and that moment can make a difference like bam, like that. Um, but even that, I would say um, it is a buildup often of so many other things along the journey that once they get there, they're primed for that experience. Um, but I would say, you know, from an emotional standpoint, um, the thing that I often will look at is what are what are people's aspirations? Um, yeah. Because ultimately, that will tell you what you need to know about what they want to feel in their lives. Um, and what is that emotional, you know, um, motivation that drives them? And it's funny, um, another myth sometimes that I um, talk about is you know this myth that consumers lie to us you know oh you can't do focus groups because consumers will just lie to you and tell you what you want to hear uh -huh. and i mean i think first of all you know there is some truth in that people will want to put up you know their best selves uh, i certainly have been in many 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 situations where you know uh, participant is telling me all about, you know, they only buy their kids, you know, healthy cereals or blah, blah, blah. You won't buy sugar. It's a, and then you go, you get into their home and you see their pantry and it's loaded, right? Um, Fruit loops galore, huh? Exactly, right? And but for me, what I would say is that is gold because what they have mm. just let you in on is where they feel like they're falling short and where they mm. need help. And so it instantly have an avenue to how I can start adding value for this person. How can I help them bridge that gap that they're feeling? At first, I have to understand what is this? It's not just that they're lying to me. It's that they're thinking about their identity. They're, you know, if it's a mom and kids, I don't want to tell this guy that I buy my kids, you know, sugary cereals. I'm not supposed to do that. I want to be seen as better than that. Okay, well, now we can work with that, right? And, and so I think this idea that, um, you know, consumer lies are somehow uh, damaging or uh, don't do us any good, I, I think is really missing the point. Um, and taking things too literally, I think when you when people and I, in this part of this is, you know, this is how I've been trained, right? Um, but is really look beyond what people are saying and see the disc if there is a disconnect just consider that so valuable um because it really does start to give you some insight into their aspirations what they want of the future how they want to be seen um and it really you then you have plenty to start working with um so that i think if you're you know if you're a small business owner or if you're um you know a marketer spend time with your customers, you know, take some time. As I said before, you know, experience is undeniable. It's one thing to um, sort of create um, an avatar in theory. Mm. But once you, once you do create the avatar, I highly recommend seek out some folks who are in that arena of your avatar and just talk to them a little bit and, and, you spend some time with them if you can, because I think that will teach you so much. You will get a broader context. You will see them in their lives. You will see how they respond to things. And I think that that can be extremely valuable when we're in a, a very competitive marketplace and making that connection 
can make or break a, a company or, or a product. Absolutely. I, I love that, um, that perspective on, you know, the way in which we're looking at aspiration, all right, so so what is it that they really want? And maybe, you know, they're not necessarily lying to you, but they're actually telling you, they are sharing with you what their aspirational mm. dream is right. as to what how they want to be. And that concept of, um, you know, and I've heard this in, in my training and in my um, experience too, is that, you know, we as people, as individuals, we, we're always looking, for, you know, it, something is either going to help us to, increase our level of um, stature or decrease. And that comes back to, again, how we feel at the, that identity level. And again, if we can overlay that even into everything that we're talking about today, when we're trying to understand, really know what that customer, you know, the person that you want to work with, what are they going through? And um, I, I tend to call that the disparity gap. You know, it's like they, they're here now. This is what they're experiencing today. But this is where they actually want to be is over there. And there's this disparity gap in the middle. And that's where I see, you know, we, the the business owner, the entrepreneur, that's where we come in and we figure Absolutely. out how we build that bridge. How do we yeah. get them from here and bridge the gap so that that disparity gap disappears? Yeah. I mean, I really have two things on this. I think I love this conversation. I think one is that um, anything we buy, anytime we're spending money on something, it is in the hopes of a better future. Um, and I mm. think that that is such a powerful perspective to come from. And actually, it's a fun dinner conversation um, for nerds like me. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you, you kind of throw that out there and people are like, well, wait, what? No, I mean, toilet paper. I'm like, well, it's a better future with it than without it. Right. So, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, it, you have to think about these things in degrees. But everything we buy, we buy in the hopes of it somehow enhancing or keeping our future from getting worse. Um, and so I, I think it's just a very powerful place to to ask questions from, you know, so, okay, so let me try to understand you know, what is it that's driving this? What is the aspiration? Um, and how can we help provide that, you know, and that, that's just a, such a powerful place to come from. The other thing I think is um, that it's one of the things that I, I consider um, an unfair advantage for small mm -hmm. business owners um, because uh, you know, in small business, owners, especially small retail, brick and mortar retail, you often have the principles of that business on the floor every day, engaging with the customer. And so they are getting that firsthand knowledge of what's being said, what's being asked for. And I think what happens is companies grow, they become further and further separated from the customer and that creates some challenges. And so if you're a small company, I say, get in there, you know, talk to your customers. If you're a very mm -hmm. large company, I say, talk, talk to your salespeople, talk to your cashiers, talk, you know, cause they're the ones who are going to have all the insight about what's really going on. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so I think, again, it, it comes back to just con continually asking questions, being curious. Um, it, it's one of the things that, I, I tell a story all the time and I'll, I'll keep it really short for this because I've already told a bunch of stories, but um, my first day of graduate school to be a psychologist, the professor told us, you'll never understand people. <laughs> like, wait, what? I just paid my tuition here. What's <laughs> going on, right? <laughs> um, I, I paid to understand people and you're right, telling me right. I'm, even with this, I'm not going to. Yeah, exactly. And, and the thing, and it took me, honestly, I, I mean, I started to get it once he started to explain it, but it wasn't until years later where it really started hitting home for me. And it now it's something, I, if you've ever seen me speak, you've probably seen me uh, tell the story because it has had such an impact on my life. Um, what he meant was when you enter into the behavioral sciences, and when I say that, I, I mean this loosely, I consider being a retailer, being on the floor, you know, being a marketer, there is an element of that that is behavioral science. But when you enter into that field, you have to accept that you, there is no there is no finish line. There is no I got it all, um, because yeah. the minute that you think you've got people figured out, that's when you start developing blind spots. 
that's when you start having biases that go unchallenged. And those can lead to disastrous um, effects if not checked. Uh, and so really his point was, the better you can accept that, the better you will be at understanding people. It's, it's sort of a, a paradox, but um, it really has just influenced my life to such a degree. And it's so I tell people, just stay curious, because as soon as you think you have it figured out, you're in for a world of hurt. So, so his message clearly was today you are a student of understanding people and you are forever going to be a student of, you know, of trying to understand people because you will never understand them. It's yeah, you've just got to keep, keep exploring, keep being yeah. curious and, uh, and just keep going. So I know that you've got like this proven step by step process that really does help approach the influencing of customers because and, and i'm you know the the whole um manipulation and you know i'm going to influence people and manipulate them down right. the path to get them to a you know it can be really gross and feel horrible but i know you've got a really lovely process that helps people to do that without having to feel gross or right. yucky about it. Do you want to share share with us what that process is? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, uh, it's funny because when we started, I said I, the, the question about how I got here was the one of the two biggest questions I get. The second one is, aren't you just tricking people into buying stuff they don't want? Um, mm. And so <laughs> uh, my, my reaction to that is, well, you can do that. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, because it's just not a good long-term strategy. Uh, you know, as as marketers today, we are sophisticated enough that we can get anyone to buy something once. But that's not sustainable mm -hmm. over time. I mean, it because what happens is someone buys your product and they feel taken or they feel like they've been coerced. The reaction, the psychological response to coercion is resistance. And if it continues, it becomes frustration, it becomes anger, and it becomes avoidance. And if you're a brand and that's how your customers responding to you, you're in a lot of trouble. So what I say is, look, you can, but anytime I hear someone talking about, oh, psych psychology tricks to use on your customers, I just think, oh, boy, mm. there's some hard lessons <laughs> coming ahead for that person. Uh, because yeah. it really, the tricks just aren't worth it. I mean, there are certain things that absolutely you can do but they aren't trickery they're not coercion they're they are little you know little things that you can do that that aren't about necessarily coercing people but it's about helping them see your message more clearly or get it noticed more effectively that's one thing but to trick people into buying something i just i just cannot abide it i just it's it for me it as a person but also as someone who's been in marketing for 25 years and I just know it does not work over time um mm. so <laughs> so to address that i have uh to your question I have created um, a process. It's called six and a half steps to influencing behavior without feeling gross. Um, and we've talked about a number of the things. So it starts step number one is build your empathy. Um, and so yeah. that really is about, you know, at the things that we've spoken about, you know, how do you start to really understand and think like your customer, not just about them. Um, and develop an empathic understanding. Like put yourself in their shoes, talk to them, be in their world, you know, so that you can really experience it. I also teach uh, something called bracketing. Um, bracketing is just a process, I didn't make it up. It's, it's something in psychology, it's when you're becoming a clinician that you learn, which is you have to become very aware of your own biases, your own perspectives, because those will be lenses through which you see the world. And so when you start to engage with someone, if you're doing research or if you just, you know, want to uh, be in a position of like, I want to understand this person, take mm -hmm. those things, like literally do, make a mental image of you taking your perspective, your lens, putting brackets around it and just setting it aside for a while so that you can come at this person with fresh eyes and, and you can see the world from their perspective versus being filtered through your own. And, and it, Sometimes the, the difference can seem very small, but it can it can really pay off in so many great ways because it opens you up to things you might not have noticed otherwise or insights that you wouldn't have realized um, otherwise. And so it's a really important first step. And, and there's, uh, you know, ask, you know, there's a process within each of these steps. Mm. Uh, but certainly the first one is building your empathy. The second is defining your outcome. So what you know, what what is the behavior that you are looking to influence? What is it currently? 
and what do you, would you like it to be? Because the better that you can define that, then the better your you know the, your more clarity you're going to have on what you need to what needs to be done, right? Um, and so that's kind of a process in itself. Is let's define what is the behavior that you're looking for, and then you have to get into. So I talked about motivation and means. So motivation is why would they want to do this? Again, looking for it from their perspective, not why do we want them to do this, but why would this person find value in in taking this behavior, whether it is a new behavior or ch changing a behavior? Um, what is it about it that will motivate them? Because as we talked about, you know, aspiration, mm -hmm. motivation is so important. And so it's really understanding like, from this person's perspective, what is it that would make a difference? You know, what, what do they what are they looking for? And then looking at the mean side of the means are the behaviors. It's the how to go about doing these things. So what might get in the way of this? So what are you know, some things that might be barriers to changing this behavior? Um, you know, it could be money could be a barrier. Time could be a barrier. Frustration could be a barrier. Um, you know, a steep learning curve could be a barrier. There's uh -huh. many different things. But to identify those, because then we can have then we have something to work with here. Like, what do we need to help them get over so that this behavior becomes sort of the path of least resistance, right? Um, mm. And then, and then from there, really, then you start to get into your strategy. So you identify, you know, if you know the motivations, if you know the potential barriers, then we can start to strategize. Um, how do we go about um, overcoming the barriers, tapping into the motivations uh, in a way that is going to really work within whatever scenario we're talking? Um, and then you need to understand receptivity. Where are they going to be receptive to our messaging or our influence? And so, you know, as someone goes about their day, their receptivity to messaging, to advertising, to marketing, um, it fluctuates throughout the day, um, as well as uh, by what's relevant and what's not relevant to them. So, again, this mm -hmm. kind of loop back to the empathy, right? And if we know... Um, if we understand this person as a person, we know what motivates them, we know what might get in the way. It helps us to understand when are they going to be most receptive to our message and what kind of messaging are they going to be receptive to. And then lastly, the half, uh, my, my six and a half, this is the half, is, is the tactics. Um, and this is where I, feel, I kind of hand off to my customer because they know their business better than I do. I can help them with the strategy. I can help get into the tactics and kind of do some editing with them, mm -hmm. some brainstorming, but they know their business far better than I ever will. And so this is where I kind of consider a handoff where um, we're working together at this point, but it is equally uh, as much them as it is me. Mm. And it kind of starts to take you down this path where it, there's nothing about this that's meant to be manipulative. It really is about looking at people in their own context, in their own scenario, in their lives. And, and you know, when I think about all those steps that you've just worked through, it is coming at it with a level of real empathy towards, you know, those that you are here to serve and to help. And when you look at it through that lens, it, it could be an absolute game changer because no longer are you sort of looking at things from what is the best for me. It's a win-win win situation yeah, which absolutely. is always best for everybody right <clears throat> absolutely I, um, and, and i think the more that you can create those win-win-win situations i mean the better again so like i've worked in shopper marketing for for decades and so i know that i i can work with a brand and have the best idea ever but if the retailer is like not going to help us at all then it's yeah. dead right and you spend all the time doing that so i know how important it is you have to have a good story you have to be able to uh, explain why this is going to be good for everyone um it just really is important. And, and empathy, I really believe, is a superpower. Um, not everybody has the same capacity for empathy, but everyone, I think, can develop it more. And, uh, you know, unless you're sort of clinically <laughs> having a situation where you're um, a sociopath or something. But um, for the most part, all of us can uh, develop empathy as a skill. Mm, absolutely. Look, I, this has been a really fantastic conversation. Like you said, I mean, we... It, it, this kind of sales, marketing, psychology side of stuff is really interesting and fascinating to me. So I could talk about this, um, you know, all day, really. Uh, but given we've got to bring this show to an end at some point, um, I want to make sure that people have got some way of being able to continue to have a conversation with you. Because like me, Absolutely. there's probably other people that are interested <laughs> in this, could 
listen to this sort of thing on the regular, where is the best place for people to go to uh, continue a relationship with you? Where should they go to? Um, you can go to my website. So it's um, mm -hmm. thebicologist.com. Let me put um, that in. And, sure. E U Y C O L O G I S T dot com. Yeah, that's correct. I spelled that right. Beautiful. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and then yeah. uh, my email is uh, chris.gray, and it's G R A Y at thebicologist.com. Um, you can find me also on Facebook on, and on LinkedIn as well. And so it, the bicologist, there's not many of us. I, it, there's, there's a million Chris Grays out there, but there's really, I think there's only one bicologist. So there's only cool. one real bicologist, right? <laughs> the, right? The real Chris Gray, go to the bicologist. Well, guys, go and head on over to Chris's website. You can continue to have a conversation with him. As I've said, Absolutely. you know, he's worked with some major companies, big companies, small companies, and also just, you know, entrepreneurs so if you want to explore this more he's got multiple programs available obviously you can have a um, very approachable guy you can have a conversation with him i'm sure he'd have no Absolutely. problem in doing that so just head on over there and uh, make sure you're able to continue the conversation this has been a fantastic um, episode i've really enjoyed this I, um, as you guys know, for those of you that have been watching, I want to just say thank you very much for being a viewer and, a, and someone that tunes in to the Unlock Show on the regular. You know that we have some fantastic guests. We're going to continue to do that throughout. Um, you know, we are fully booked now until December of this year and moving into uh, into twenty twenty three. So we're jam packed with lots of great guests. We run the show on Wednesdays and Fridays. It is a live show, guys. So. If you want to tune in, you just tune in, make sure that you allow StreamYard to see you. That then enables you to ask any questions. So if you're tuning in and you've got a question for either myself or for one of the guests that we have, type it, you know, type away. We'll be more than happy to answer that for you. And if you have any questions that have, you know, sort of sprung to mind as a result of today's show, head on over to Facebook, find the Success Secrets for Business, Family and Life group join the group you'll see the show that's being streamed in there at the bottom of um of that show you'll be able to type in there and either myself or chris will be sure to uh, awesome. to come back and actually answer your guys questions very cool and again you can head on over to uh, youtube this is streamed on youtube subscribe so that you never miss a beat and also head on over to any of your major you know your favorite podcasting platform and you can also find the unlock show with tracy wilson there You'll be able to download it and again you'll be able to have me in your ears along with my amazing guests so i want to say thank you very much um chris for being an amazing guest today it's been a very interesting uh conversation that we've had and i hope you guys uh, that have been tuning in have enjoyed today's show too give chris a big round of applause um and you know give him a bit a little, little bit of love in the comment section awesome thank you so much tracy it's been a delight i really appreciate the opportunity to just talk about something obviously i'm so passionate about so Really great conversation. Awesome. Well, you have a fantastic evening. And you guys that are watching today, you guys have a fantastic rest of the afternoon. I'll be back with another episode of The Unlock Show, 10 a.m. this Friday, Brisbane time. And then again next week on Wednesday. So uh, as I always say, you've got to go and live your life unlocked because there is just no other way. Bye for now, guys. See you Friday. Mm -hmm.